So I want to begin this morning with a, with a bit of an aside, a digression that's, that's also a bit of a confession. My confession is that one of my guilty pleasures that I enjoy is listening to sports talk radio. And so on days when I leave the office at noon, I head out to pick up some lunch, I often flip on the radio to the David Glenn show to hear what he's talking about at the top of his program. Honestly, he's not my favorite. But all this week, all this week, he's earned, uh, earned back a lot of my respect. He has been on a roll using the NCAA's decision to cancel championship tournament games across North Carolina because of HB2, and the ACC's decision to cancel championship tournament games across North Carolina because of HB2 as an opportunity to absolutely skewer our governor and legislature for their regressive, foolish, and destructive leadership. And, and I just want to just want to tell you a little bit. Here's here's a pair. Of, I actually was listening, and I, I was heading. Out. I actually had to pull over to take a few notes because here is how here is how he David Glenn began his show on Friday. He said it used to be a few years ago that when I traveled abroad, I would joyfully say that I was from North Carolina because when I told people where I was from, they would respond by mentioning the great things about the state how this state is a state with the best college basketball in, a wor in the world. People would talk about our beautiful beaches and our great mountains. They'd talk about our great universities. And people who even knew a little bit more would talk about how North Carolina was becoming the crown jewel, the brightest light of the New South, a place where Fortune 500 companies and biotech companies chose to relocate to, in a state that was becoming the fastest growing progressive state in the South. But now, David Glenn continued, when I travel, I tell people I'm from North Carolina, they react like that's something to be embarrassed about. North Carolina, I've found, is now synonymous with bigotry, with discrimination, with backwardness and ignorance. And then he exclaimed, people are beginning to see us like we're another Mississippi. And he went on, he went on, he said, this governor and this legislature have done more through their failure of leadership. They've done far more than cost us hundreds of millions of dollars, and that they've done. They've ruined our reputation, our good name for the rest of the world. And that's from a sports talk radio host. This morning, I want to say something else. I want to say something else about North Carolina's reputation, something a lot more positive. Last June, I was at the Unitarian Universalist General Assembly, and I was wearing my name badge, the name badge that said I was from North Carolina, and someone came up to me and, and looked at my badge, and I thought, oh, oh, here we go. And they said, North Carolina? Isn't that where William Barber's from? William Barber was one of our denomination's special guests brought down he brought down the House, brought down the House at General Assembly, speaking to the entire assembly and then leading a workshop that was standing room only with people out the door and down the hall trying to listen, and then uh, speaking at a rally. And then in July, in July, after William Barber brought down the House at the Democratic National Convention, Facebook and Twitter lit up like they like they're want to do, and I had a few friends who actually contacted me and said, Tom, you're, you're in North Carolina now. How about that, Reverend Barber? And this past Monday, this past Monday, there was held a day of moral witness that was held in Raleigh and simultaneously held in 29 state capitals around the country. And um, one of my friends, one of my friends posted, Scott posted on Facebook, I'm off to Moral Mondays, Moral Mondays, Indianapolis. And my friend Hank said, I'm off to Moral Mondays, posted a picture. Here, we, here I am at Moral Mondays, Moral Mo Mondays, Boston. Truly a different sort of reputation for our state. Reputation. What are you known for? What are you known for? In the writings of the biblical prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, Amos and Micah, and all the rest, there's a distinction that's often made, often made be between our reputation for things that don't matter and our reputation for justice. 
reputation for the performance of ritual and, and reputation for the performance of acts of mercy. There's that famous passage from the prophet Amos. I hate, I despise your festivals. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. And even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and peace like an ever-flowing stream. And the prophet Isaiah says much the same thing. He says, my soul hates your new moons and your appointed festivals. They've become a burden to me. Wash yourselves, not your hands before sacrifice. Make yourselves clean, and not the burnt offering. Remove the evil from your doings. Seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. There's reputation there. How are you known? How are you known? For your festivals or your justice? For your assemblies or for your acts of righteousness? According to the prophets, this is how we're judged. So part of what I want to say this morning is just to ask us here to pause for a second, to pause for a few moments of gratitude, a few moments of thankfulness, some prayer and some praise. Because what a blessing it is, what a blessing it is to live here, to live now, to live just a few miles down the road from the state capitol during this time of moral revival. To be here now at this place at this time as part of a moral movement what a blessing to be part of a congregation that has joyfully signed on to the Forward Together Moral Movement and the Moral Mondays Coalition. What a blessing. And at the same time that I offer these words of joyful praise, I also, I also feel I have to offer a few words of admonition. And so I want to ask, for a little show of hands here, how many people here in the room, how many people in the room got arrested at a Moral Mondays? Look at that. Wow. Woo. So I want to ask how many people how many people have been? How many people have been to a Moral Mondays? Look at that, a good number. And how many people have been to HK on J on a on a Saturday? And how many people have been to hear William Barber speak at another type of a of a thing? Look at that, some more hands. Some more hands. I won't ask how many people haven't been. But uh, but I'd say if you haven't if you didn't raise your hand, you need you need to go. You need to go. If you lived in Washington, D.C. in 1963, you don't want to be the person who says, well, the weather was really hot that August day, so I decided to stay home instead of going to the March on Washington. And so when your great-grandchildren ask, when your great-grandchildren ask you to tell them a story, ask them to share hope, share hope through a story, what story will you have to tell? There's some, there's some great stories. There's some great stories happening here in North Carolina. Each year for the past seven years, the UUA, the Unitarian Universalist Association, has selected a book as our common read in the same way that towns and universities like UNC have a common read where they ask everybody in the community to read the same book. And uh, this year, this year, the book that's been selected is none other than William Barber's The Third Reconstruction. They've invited every single UU, every single UU in our country and even around the world to read about William Barber here in North Carolina. It's a slender volume, and uh, it's part autobiography, part the story of Moral Mondays, and part instruction manual for building a new justice movement. And so at the beginning of this church year, I wanted to kind of call your attention to this and encourage you to be a part of that common read. I think a lot of us know, know the story, but uh, we don't want to be caught. And people say, they don't want to, when we, go, when we go travel somewhere else, say, oh, I read the book, and then, them to know stuff that we don't know about ourselves. So, um, and it's fun. It's fun to read a book. It's fun to read the history of something that you've been a part of. And so as I read the book, I, I come across these names of people that I've met and these names of people that I've seen. So I want to leave you with just one, one learning, one takeaway from this book that I um, really enjoyed, which is the idea 
which is the idea of, of a fusion movement. He calls this movement the Third Reconstruction. The First Reconstruction was after the days of slavery, when uh, freed African Americans, freed slaves, joined together with poor whites and joined together with progressives to form a, to form a coalition to work to build a, a better world, and how that, that Reconstruction was resisted violently by people who didn't want people to join together. And then he talks about the second Reconstruction being the civil rights movement, a movement that, that, goes, that goes even beyond civil rights, a movement that was growing to involve people working for peace and, and labor and race all together, all together, civil rights movement, and how that movement was, was resisted, faced a massive resistance for its attempt to blend people together. And so what he says is we need a third reconstruction, which will be a fusion movement, a fusion movement of different groups and different people working together. And so when I walked out, uh, when I headed out uh, in May to go to the Moral Mondays, the Moral Mondays at which I was arrested, um, it was a Moral Mondays focused on, on House Bill 2, on HB 2. And so as I was leaving, I was, I was with a friend that morning, and I said to my friend, I said, I'm going to go... Uh, I'm going to go protest HB2 with William Barber. And uh, my friend said, why would the, why would the African-American church, the African-American churches are, are protesting about transgender rights? And I said, yes. I said, yes, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. This is a fusion movement. This is a, move, a fusion movement. And so when I got there, when I got there at the, at the a demonstration before we walked into the legislative building to get arrested, I remember Barbara saying to the crowd, saying, say, if you came here with Lambda Legal, if you came here with the Human Rights Campaign, don't just show up today. Show up, show up next time for voting rights, as we showed up for you today and said, message I've heard, that, that labor, if you're showing up here for, for labor, you also need to come show up for, for women's rights. And if you're a women's rights person, you need to show up for the environment. And if you're environment, you need to show up for labor. That's how we build. That's how we build a fusion movement. And so with that, uh, with those thoughts, I commend to you the book. I commend to you the, the, live, the living history that we're a part of here in North Carolina. And I give thanks. And I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that after we win, after we win, that David Glenn can go back to talking about sports.